Welcome to this Health Foundation webinar on what we know about how to improve quality and safety in hospitals and what we still need to learn. This webinar focuses on regulation of healthcare, which is a very topical area at present. The first thing we need to do when we're seeking to regulate any system is think very hard about what the goal is. One of the advantages of healthcare is that it's very easy to identify what the goal of regulation is and that is to ensure that we provide safe, good quality care that's respectful to patients. Unfortunately, that's probably the only easy thing about designing a regulatory system for healthcare. When we're designing a regulatory system, we need to think about what the components of the system should be. Christopher Hood, who's Professor of Government at All Souls College in Oxford, offers us a very useful and simple model, which has three components that interact cybernetically. The first thing you do is set standards, so you need to be clear about what standards need to be met. Then you gather information which shows you how well you're achieving. And then you have a system that allows you to modify behaviour or change things so that you meet the standards optimally. The evidence is that in healthcare we struggle in all three areas of Hood's model. Let's think for a moment, for example, about keeping patients safe. The evidence is that it's very, very difficult to keep patients safe in hospital. One of the best systematic reviews in the area suggests that the incidence of adverse events is around 9% in hospitals worldwide. So patients have approximately a 1 in 10 chance of being injured when admitted to hospital. We reckon that something like half of those events are preventable. So there's huge potential for improvement particularly as around 7% of adverse events have a fatal outcome. If we think about another component of Hood's model, modifying behaviour and making changes to systems, challenges have also been encountered in healthcare. Progress has been slow and solutions are not easy, as Bob Wachter's excellent piece has identified for us. I'll give you some examples of the kinds of problems that we encounter when we're trying to provide high quality, safe care for patients. One of these relates to the reliability of healthcare systems. This very good study published recently suggested that the reliability of systems in seven NHS organisations ranged from 81% to 87%. For example, a doctor who attempts an operation in an operating theatre has a 63 to 88% chance of the equipment being available. That means that there is a very high level of unreliability in those systems. In outpatient clinics, about 15% of patients lack some kind of relevant clinical information. One of the problems that we have in trying to make healthcare safe is the problem of deciding what the standards should be. In some areas where regulation is very important, such as aviation, it's actually fairly easy to set the standard. If you get on a plane, then you should have a reasonable expectation of arriving alive and in one piece. The problem with setting a similar standard for healthcare is that the kind of people that are looked after in healthcare systems are those that may die anyway. And it's also true that there are some adverse events that we cannot prevent, no matter how safe our systems are. These are inherently risky and dangerous procedures and some level of adverse event will always occur. What is now becoming clear is that the incidence of preventable death is much lower than was previously estimated. In an excellent study published in the summer of 2012, British researchers estimated that only 5% of deaths in hospital are preventable. They also show that many problems related to quality of clinical monitoring and not to catastrophic errors of the kind that we've previously associated with the patient safety movement. Another problem is knowing how well we're doing, thinking about Hood's component of gathering information. In three major rankings of US hospitals, we find that there is a lot of discordance between the rankings given by different ranking systems. Massachusetts General Hospital, for example, gets an A from LeapFrog and is ranked top by US News and World Report but only gets 45 out of 100 from consumer reports. The bottom six hospitals in the consumer reports ranking all got an A from LeapFrog. So that tells us that you get different kinds of rankings depending on what system of information you're using. And it's very, very hard to work out which is the best and which has problems. 
Another recent study looked at how well it was possible to identify the high-performing hospital. This study showed that only a handful of hospitals appeared to consistently score highly on all measures used in this study and that even that may be a chance finding. We have now had around 15 years of interest in the problem of wrong site surgeries. We've recognised that the problem of patients having operations on the wrong body part or even operations on the wrong patients for around 15 years now. And if we look at this graph, we can see that the number of incidents being reported every year is going up. But what we don't know is whether that number means that the number of incidents is going up or whether the number reported is going up. There are some who argue that this graph shows that we're getting safer because now we're recognising these problems and reporting them and learning how to deal with them. There are others who suggest that this means that we're actually getting worse at dealing with this problem, not better. And there isn't anybody in the world who can really give you the answer to what the true picture is. I'll illustrate this further using the story of one UK hospital. This hospital was rated by the then regulator, the Healthcare Commission, as one of four most improved hospitals in 2006-2007. Dr. Foster's Good Hospital Guide in November 2009 ranked it in the top 10 best hospitals for safety. Very shortly afterwards, the Care Quality Commission said that care in this hospital was appalling. This hospital was Mid-Staffordshire. I think probably one of the most poignant quotes about this business of ranking hospitals came from a doctor at the hospital who commented that It soon became clear that the real position of the hospital in the National League of Awfulness did not matter. What did matter was that many patients had received poor care and that for some their treatment was appalling. I'd like to build on Hood's model and propose a new model for thinking about how we regulate patient safety and quality in healthcare. I'd like to suggest that we start with gathering intelligence. We then move on to looking at systems. We then move on to looking at culture and behaviour. And we understand that all three of these components are in constant dynamic interaction and that you can't have quality and safety unless you have all three functioning optimally. So let's start thinking about intelligence first of all. When we think about intelligence in healthcare, we often think about measurement. And it's absolutely clear that we need to measure how we're doing in healthcare. We need measures to signal priority, show what's important. We need measures to create mission so people know what's important and are able to organise and cohere around that measure. When we're measuring, we're able to assess improvement and know when things are deteriorating. We're able to provide feedback to staff so they know how they're doing and where they need to improve and where they can celebrate. We need to measure so that we can identify areas for intervention. And we also need to measure so that we can improve transparency and accountability to patients. They deserve to know how well the services that they use are performing. What I want to emphasise is that if you're not measuring, you're not managing. We cannot run health systems unless we are measuring. But if you're measuring stupidly, you're not managing either. And I'm going to suggest that we do an awful lot of stupid measurement in healthcare. I'm also going to suggest that if you're only measuring, you're not managing. It's not possible to get high quality intelligence if you rely only on measurement. At the moment, we use many different kinds of measures in healthcare. One of the things we do is use so-called data for improvement. This is data collected as part of quality improvement cycles. It's now become clear that the data collected for improvement can often be extremely poor quality. This study by Jonathan Benn and colleagues at Imperial College showed that when data for improvement are collected, they often have insufficient data points. The baseline periods are often too short. When staff are running these quality improvement cycles, they may change samples and sampling strategies, but not properly explain why. And often changes that are made during the course of a program are inadequately annotated. So the quality of data for improvement is often in need of improvement. And this is because measuring well is really, really tough. We published this paper in Milbank Quarterly last year, 
which investigated what happened when intensive care units were asked to set up systems for collecting data on central line infections. The units in this programme had been provided with clear, explicit, well-defined measures, but they still struggled. We found that the units were not counting either denominators or numerators consistently. We found very wide variability in underlying clinical practices and laboratory support. And overall, we found that it was very unsafe to assume that infection rates between different units were comparable because of underlying differences in the way that the units were collecting and reporting the data. The other problem is that at the moment, we're probably measuring far too much. This paper published very recently showed that in the US, National Quality Forum measures went from 200 in 2005 to over 700 in 2011. The US Centre for Medicare and Medicaid Services has introduced 65 new measures in the last year alone. And at Massachusetts General Hospital, measuring consumes 1% of net patient service revenue. So it's very important to measure, but if we're going to measure, we need to do it really intelligently and we need to avoid relying on measurement as a sole source of intelligence. If we're going to regulate well in healthcare, we need to use multiple sources of information as starting points for understanding, for problem sensing, and also for reward. It's true that much of the time in healthcare, we fail to reward people for the improvements that they've made and for the wonderful service that they are delivering to patients. What's clear is that we often neglect some of the very best sources of intelligence, and they are staff and patients. It's clear that there is a relationship between staff, morale, well-being and teamwork, and the quality and safety of the care that they provide. So learning about how well staff feel they're able to provide care is a very important source of intelligence. We need to be asking staff about what concerns them and treating seriously concerns that they raise. We also need to be able to make good judgments about when to intervene and when it's appropriate to allow local frontline staff to resolve problems for themselves. We need to get much better at using intelligence from patients themselves. Knowing whether staff would recommend a service is important, but also knowing whether patients would recommend a service to others provides important insights into how well services are doing. When we have studied healthcare organisations, we have been most reassured by organisations that are problem sensing. In these organisations, they actively search for harm. When we have studied healthcare organisations, we have been most concerned by organisations that are comfort seeking. These are organisations that rather than trying to learn about their problems, look for comfort. If you're going to problem sense, you need to integrate data for care and data for audit where possible. Too often, when audits are run, it involves setting up time-consuming new systems to generate data. This can frustrate staff and it means they feel that they're being distracted from patient care to collecting data. As far as possible, we need to be collecting data that can be used for dual purposes, for knowing how we're doing and for caring for patients at the same time. We also need to learn how to balance between external measures and internal measures. Introduce too many external measures and then there is no resource for internal measurement and internal intelligence gathering that can help people learn about what's important to them locally. Too often when data are collected, they are not interpreted in ways that help organisations to learn. When organisations insist upon comfort seeking, they use data in ways that are not wise. They're using data in order to comfort themselves that they're okay or not doing as badly as others, not to learn how to improve and to make sure that the care patients get is as good as possible. Problem sensing organizations use multiple forms of intelligence. They complement measurement with talking. They complement talking with walking and they learn all the time how to get better. So learning means a focus on action, not collecting data passively and then failing to turn that into actionable plans. Let's move now to the second component of the model I've proposed for regulating healthcare. And let's think about systems. One of the great achievements of the last 10 years in healthcare 
has been a real recognition of what we need to do to improve the quality and safety of care that we provide by thinking about how to improve the systems that deliver that care. Human Factors has made a huge contribution in this regard. I've reproduced here a slide from the World Health Organization which summarizes many of the things that we need to do if we're going to make care safe. We have to stop relying on individuals remembering to do things. We need to make things more visible. We need to review and simplify processes and where possible standardize common processes and procedures so that people know exactly what to do in each environment and don't have to relearn each time. We need to routinely use checklists and above all, we have to decrease the reliance on individual vigilance as a way of making sure that patients are okay. None of these things are to argue that we abandon vigilance altogether or that people no longer have to remember anything, but where possible, we need to use human factors contributions to make systems safer for patients. The problem we have with healthcare systems is that they are often piecemeal. They have not been designed from scratch and how they function in practice is often very poorly understood. Ad hoc improvisations and adaptations are therefore often the norm, with staff being ingenious with how they manage to make the systems work even though they are poorly designed to meet their needs. What we often find in healthcare as well is that there's very limited understanding of what it takes to achieve peak performance. People do very well with getting by and getting through, but what it takes to actually be the best and to perform at peak level is much less well understood. What we have found when we study healthcare organisations is that what we call the blunt end of the organisation, the executive and board level, often has a very poor grasp of the operational detail at the sharp end. This is a source of enormous frustration for people at the sharp end because it appears to them that the kinds of concerns they have in delivering care, the operational and logistical difficulties that they face every day seem to be poorly understood. An example of the problems that piecemeal systems cause for people in providing healthcare to patients is that of infusion pumps. Over a thousand incidents were reported to the National Patient Safety Agency between 2005 and 2010 relating to infusion pumps, which are very important in the care of patients. But these pumps have many, many different designs some switch one way, some switch the other, and they sometimes do completely different things depending on how they're programmed. Junior doctors and nurses are the people who are most likely to be encountering these pumps. They can't be trained on every single model in every single hospital, with the result that many accidents occur when people transfer the learning from the last pump they used to the new one. You can walk around most hospitals in the UK and they may be using many, many different types of pumps. Sometimes, even on the same ward, you'll find many different models in use. So what we are doing is running infusion pump provision in the same way as I run my mug cupboard at home. And as you can see, I have a motley collection of many different types of cups. I've added to these gradually over the years. I have no strategy on how and when I'm going to replace them. When one breaks, I buy a new one, but often without thinking about how it's going to fit into any scheme and what training I might need for each new cup. The challenge of improving systems is a huge one, and it's one we've often underestimated in healthcare. Improving a system requires very specific kinds of skills and expertise. It often importantly involves working across many, many different areas, because changing a system in one place can mean knock-on effects for people in many other different parts of organisations, and this often goes unrecognised. Improving systems also requires real engagement with staff. When systems improvements are made, they're often made on staff. If they're made with staff, they tend to be much, much more effective. An example from some of the hospitals that we've seen is this wonderful whiteboard, which is used for indicating which patients have had which procedures. A busy nurse can look at this whiteboard and instantly know who needs to be weighed, who needs to have an aspirin, and can do this without having to check through multiple notes in order to know how each patient is doing. This whiteboard was the brilliant idea of a team who were able to introduce this and make an improvement very, very quickly because they were able to draw on their own ingenuity. Many problems will require much more extensive design and innovation. 
The problem of handover is one that's become increasingly important, especially with new working patterns and with the number of transitions that patients need to make between different services. I'm going to talk for a few moments about a fantastic study which involved improving handover from surgery to intensive care for very vulnerable patients, small children undergoing cardiac surgery. This improvement programme drew on methods used in Formula One racing. The team observed what happened when Ferrari has to change a wheel in a pit stop. It requires huge amounts of coordination, fantastic teamwork and really excellent technical processes. By transferring what they learned from watching these teams who could do things very, very quickly with a very high rate of reliability, the team at Great Ormond Street was able to secure enormous improvements in the quality of handover they were making from difficult surgical procedures to intensive care, where babies need to be taken off one set of machines and then plugged into a new set of machines in a new environment. This is a very high risk moment in the care of these children where many things were going wrong. The team that made these improvements were able to reduce their error rate from 39% of patients to 11.5%, a huge improvement that means real benefits for patients. And they did this by problem sensing. They realized they had problems. They made changes by learning from achievements in other areas and they improved their systems with remarkable results. We've now learned a lot about the challenges that are encountered when teams try to improve systems. And for anyone looking for examples of those challenges and how they can best be overcome, the Health Foundation report on overcoming challenges to improving quality offers a lot of useful learning. So let's just summarize lessons on improving systems. It's really important that you know how well you're doing. So focusing on discovery and making an absolute commitment to honesty is a key element of learning problem sensing, not comfort seeking. It doesn't really matter how you improve, just make sure you use a systematic structured way to improve and learn as you go. There are many different methods available from many different organizations and to date the evidence has not determined which of those is the best. So at the moment the advice is any systematic structured way of making improvements will probably be fine. It's important to get feedback and progress and find merit where you can. It's challenging to healthcare teams when somebody turns up with an improvement project. They need to be engaged at the earliest possible stages and not made to feel that this is some kind of unwarranted intrusion into what they do or is a criticism of what they've already achieved. What's also beginning to become clear is that if you improve systems, then behaviour and culture change often follow. What's also important to emphasise is that there are no quick fixes in changing any system. And often changing one component of a system has implications elsewhere that need to be actively identified. Let's turn to our third and final component of our model for regulating healthcare. And that's the emphasis on culture and behaviour. It's becoming very clear now that eroding collegial principles is very, very dangerous and trying to regulate healthcare solely through rules doesn't work. This is because we cannot design perfect rules. We cannot measure everything we need to know about and there are real risks that by using rules that are too hard and by tying people only to things that can be measured, we risk crowding out intrinsic motivation and undermining professional will. It's now very, very clear that if you neglect the emotional and cultural dimensions of what you are doing when you seek to make improvements, you will fail. One of the things we have learned from areas completely outside healthcare is the importance of social norms and the importance in particular of norms that are visible in particular environments. This is a series of studies from the Netherlands which looked at the effects of disorderly environments on people's behaviour. If we look at the car park, this describes an experiment where in the control condition, the shopping trolleys were put neatly away. When people got back to their cars and found a flyer that the researchers had placed on their windscreen, they littered that flyer about 30% of the time. In the experimental condition, which you can see here, the shopping trolleys are left out, indicating that people have not bothered or have been too busy to put the trolleys away. 
In this condition, when people got back to their cars and found a flyer on the windscreen, they littered that flyer 60% of the time. So disorder engendered disorder. What we've also learned is that it's critical that for professional workers, which is what we have in healthcare, I'm very lucky to have them, we need to mobilise intrinsic motivation. Frontline teams need to know how well they're doing because they want to do well. Often frontline teams are very, very well aware of where the problems lie and they often have fantastic ideas about how they can be fixed. What they are also good at doing is knowing what contextual adaptation needs to be made in order to get something to work. It's really, really important that we recognise that frontline teams want to do well. And when things are standing in the way, it's often they who hold the keys to improvement. I'll illustrate this using the example of the famous Michigan programme to reduce central line infections published in the New England Journal of Medicine in December 2006. The Michigan programme is remarkable for showing a dramatic reduction in rates of central line infections in over 100 ICUs that were participating in the programme. At the start of the programme, the average rate of central line infections per 1,000 catheter days was 7.7. 18 months later, it was down to 1.4. This was a huge improvement and it was secured by engaging frontline staff in the changes that needed to be made by feeding back data that was meaningful to them, by helping them to know how they could make the improvements. It's important that we really understand how the Michigan program worked. It's sometimes attributed to the success of a simple checklist. The checklist summarised the five key technical practices that ensure that patients can be kept safe during central line insertion and later care. But Michigan was really much more than a checklist intervention. It's best understood as a culture change intervention that made patient safety a priority. And work that we have done with Peter Pronovost, who led the Michigan program, has summarised this. If we are going to regulate, then it's really important that the incentives are aligned to the goals of regulation. And let's remember that the goal of regulation is to ensure a safe, good quality care that's respectful to patients. Too often when incentives are introduced, they are not properly understood. They conflict, they compete, they fail to cohere, or they generate unintended consequences. I'm not just talking about financial incentives here, I'm talking about all kinds of incentives, including reputational incentives and professional incentives. We have not understood how these can be designed so that they work together rather than competing in order to assure the goal of achieving safe, high quality care for patients. If we look at the example of financial penalties, these have become increasingly important and popular as a way of regulating healthcare, but they often have unintended consequences and the evidence that they work is often very weak. What they tend to do is amplify blame avoidance behaviours and take the resource out of already stressed systems. We need to get better at designing systems that actually encourage the behaviours that we want. Too often when we have designed targets and set goals, we've done so in ways that induce terror rather than encouraging a, an authentic commitment to improving care for the sake of patients. What we now know from the evidence on improving culture and behaviour in relation to quality and safety is that too often easy solutions or solutions that appeal to popular sentiment are introduced, but often with very little good quality evidence that they work. In some hospitals that we have visited, forms are the solution to every safety problem that occurs. This is a temptation that has to be resisted because they induce other kinds of problems. The focus has got to be on making safe, high quality care easier, not harder to do. We need to respect and value staff. We need to know when it's a systems problem, when it's a people problem, and when one is feeding the other. Too often we fail to distinguish these and we end up mistaking systems problems for people problems or people problems for systems problems. So the model suggests that if we're going to improve patient safety and quality, we need to think about intelligence, systems, culture and behaviour. And the thinking about any of those components on their own doesn't work we need to think about how to secure all three. Huge challenges lie ahead. We have to commit to learning, and that means that we have to incentivize honesty, 
We really need to know how well we're doing and we really need to know how well the solutions we introduce are doing. If we keep the focus locked onto patient benefit and not blame engineering, we can go a very long way. Thank you for listening.